the fintech portion of the event in the first half, followed by a short break, and now we're going to dive deeper into the insure tech portion uh, to kind of set the agenda for the insure tech portion. First, we have an executive panel to go over the insure tech landscape in Southeast Asia. Uh, we'll do that for about 30 minutes. We have a brief overview of plug and play's insure tech platform regionally and globally, and then we have 12 startup pitches followed by lunch. Uh, please do not forget to, to vote for your favorite startups from the previous session in FinTech as well as the InsureTech one. So right now we're going to get the InsureTech panel started and I'll do a brief introduction of the panelists and I'd like to invite them to the stage. Uh, so we have Neil Gardner who's the Chief Customer Officer of Generali Asia. We have Vince, Vincent Lopez who's the Deputy CEO of Asia Pacific for SCORE. We have Arvind Matur, who is the Chief Information Technology Officer for Prudential Singapore, and Carl Heinzium, who is the CEO of Ergo Insurance. And moderating the panel is our dear friend Ali Safavi, who is the uh, Global Head of InsureTech for Plug and Play InsureTech, coming from Silicon Valley. So please give him a warm welcome, and I'll invite everyone to come back to the seats as well. individuals from different parts of the APAC. Uh, thank you so much for making time. Um, the way that I think about these panels a lot of times is that, um, as, as we talk to the panelists, is to just have a conversation that we find interesting and then hope uh, everyone else would find uh, the conversation interesting as well. Uh, on the panel, uh, the good thing is that we have representatives of different industry, uh, parts of the industry and value chain as well as different roles. So we have uh, Neil, who is the Chief Customer Officer on the APAC level of Generali. We have Arvin, who is the CTO of uh, Singapore Business for Prudential. Uh, we have Carl, uh, he's uh, the Country Manager for Ergo in, in Singapore. As well as Vincent, who is the Deputy CEO of APAC. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. As well as uh, soon to be the Deputy Chief Knowledge Officer of uh, SCORE. So thank you uh, so much guys for joining. Um, the first topic that I think uh, based on the conversations we've had with a lot of uh, our partners has been an issue is that how do you really structure your innovation initiatives, especially focused on uh, APAC and the unique characteristics of APAC. Every market is different, the needs are different, the demographics are different, product offerings are different. So the first thing I'd like to ask the panelists, and we could start with you Carl here maybe, is that how do you guys go about it? What are your lessons learned in, in, in tackling that? Okay, for me it's a bit easier because we are focused on Singapore, but we have here very traditional sales channels, agents and brokers. We have a set of products that we need to uh, improve. And what we are doing, we try to find other ideas, trying to look for partnerships and get going. So we had one with PayPal, we might mention later, and we try and see what really works in this country. Very cool. Yeah, so we took a very, uh, we started a massive transformation effort at Potential about three years ago. And the approach we took, we looked at what models exist. There are many ways to, to, to drive innovation. The approach we took was to actually take the whole Singapore business, which is the second largest piece of uh, potential business in, in the region, and we've turned that into an innovation hothouse, essentially. Right? What does that mean? What that means is that right from the CEO on, everyone has, has goals and objectives, which are, of course, to deliver the business, but also to deliver strategic innovation programs. We set a, a, a medium to long term goal, vision for where we want to see the industry go. And there are, there are plans to, to move us as a business in that direction. And the whole business unit is focused on driving innovation. We spent a, a, 
a, a, a significant amount of time focusing on what does it mean to be an innovative organization, the culture, the mindset, the behavioral aspects of that, and transform at the core and then incentivize people to, to try out things. So that's given us a, a, a very interesting approach versus doing innovation in a, in a separate innovation center. Um, it is a, a process which of course takes, takes an effort and energy, but when we see the results of that, they're deeply embedded in the business and they're, they're, they're making an impact. The leverage we get out of that is significant because it's our full business that's now leveraging that innovation quickly. So we've, we've had that work quite well for us. So it sounds like you guys are very independent from Prudential PLC. Is that is that am I reading it right or no? Because it sounds like everything is so localized that Prudential PLC is not really involved in in what's happening here when it comes to innovation. And especially also, I'm curious to hear more about the CTO's role in innovation because in a lot of cases, I think people have started building CDO or innovation and so on. And as we have again representatives from different functions, I would like to hear more about what's your specific role in the whole in the whole journey. So for, for this kind of innovation to happen, it, it cannot happen only in isolation. So the reason why Singapore took that role was because our regional global leadership believed in the fact that we need to create the future. And for that, Singapore was expected to drive a lot of these changes. So, so this is not in isolation, this is a, 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 an intent to drive it harder here with the intent to, to then cross-fertilize these ideas and bring this to other places as well. So it's, it's a combination of those two. Very cool. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that. And I think where the industry is starting to wake up is that innovation isn't the responsibility of technology anymore. And I think that's part of what most organizations' cultures are trying to change, which is that innovation is a responsibility of every employee. Technology is maybe just the enabler of that, of that innovation. I think we've come out of an, an era in the past where we, we let kind of technology drive the innovation train. And, and I think, you know, from my point of view, it's very much more about understanding the customer and their needs and then trying to figure out how technology plays a role in that. Uh, and I think that's most of our focus is on trying to change our internal culture around understanding innovation and how it can play a role as opposed to trying to understand the technology component which is equally as important but it's not it shouldn't be driving the train as it were and i think it is very important to understand that innovation can be coming from anywhere i think we always have a tendency to look innovation uh, from the customer perspective and thinking that innovation is only about product but innovation is actually everywhere in every of uh, our internal processes as well uh, and as a consequence everyone in the company can have a role to play in changing the way the organization delivers whatever it has to deliver so whether it delivers product to our customers but also the way it delivers uh, services ultimately through our own internal processes so uh, understanding that everyone has a role to play and that everyone is allowed actually to think out of the box, to change processes, to change the way we work, to change technology um, is, is crucial. So in that regard, um, we started in, in our company uh, a process that would just be allowing people to explore whatever they have to explore. Um, limitless, no boundaries, um, no uh, no uh, obligation to stay in your own function, but actually go and, and, and seek and come back with whatever you learned. And then this learning needs to become a collective knowledge and the collective knowledge, you need then some sort of governance in order to make sure that you can leverage it globally so that uh, this time that uh, everybody spent uh, on in the, whatever innovation space benefits to the entire community. Uh, it looks a little bit wishy-washy, saying just said this way, but uh, it starts from there. There is a load of collective knowledge in the company that it is extremely important that as a whole we leverage. Very interesting, and especially I think uh, one of the things that is interesting for me is SCORE, a lot of times it's focused on innovation for clients, it's not just SCORE innovation, right? So what has been your experience in both leveraging the centralized SCORE knowledge base, especially with the current role that you're transitioning into, uh, in helping the clients on a local level, regional level, and global level? How, how has that played out so far? Yeah, 
would say I, I don't think there is a one unique model uh, in order to uh, in order to answer that question. And uh, even I said earlier on that innovation can be can be coming from uh, anybody within the company. Actually, innovation obviously comes also from from our clients, from the overall environment, uh, and especially the startup environment here. Um, you want to make sure that actually you open up all possible doors when it comes to uh, uh, leveraging innovation anywhere. So. A bottom-up approach works. Uh, a top-down approach works. Uh, if innovation is coming from uh, from from the middle ground, then uh, you need to be able to to tap into it as well. So it is about having an organization as a whole that is able to uh, open up and making sure that information flows, uh, that um, new product services, new ideas, if ever they are relevant to a local market, then people are empowered to deliver whatever they have to deliver and if it's successful that the information flows back to the top level so that it can be reused afterwards um, and then that it can be uh, uh, pushed up to other markets as well. So we do have um, an organization that, that works in, uh, in this way. Uh, tools are also very important, communication tools, networking, having some uh, um, exchange platforms within the company to make sure that this uh, information and that the various initiatives that uh, exist here and there are leveraged globally. Very interesting. And Neil, I'm actually curious to more, know more about how does, how does Generali, because Generali is doing a lot on a, on a European level and, and they experiment a lot. And then when I think about your role as a chief customer officer, which is more on the distribution front, and then when you think about the back office and their needs and, and, and all that, how does that collaboration work? The front office on a market level, the back office on a regional level, as well as all the amazing stuff generally is doing on a global level. Yeah, I think it uh, comes down to the connectivity with the organization. We were talking earlier about the misnomer of being geographically organized and that, you know, with South Asia specifically, the needs in the different marketplaces and our own footprint, you know, we've got different product lines in different markets, means that there is a lack of similarity sometimes between the Asian countries. And actually, you may find more similarities with a country in South America or a country in, in Eastern Europe. And so part of the regional and global roles are trying to make those connections across geographical boundaries. Uh, certainly when you're talking about distribution and the front end where you're talking about customer needs and customer segments. On the back office side, I think the the, the, the internal structure plays, plays a better role because there is a little more consistency on your internal processes. You know, it's not uncommon for you to have a global platform around accounting or around risk management, um, but typically the front end is hyper-personalized because the customer segments are very, very different, certainly in our business across the markets. And we rely on our head office to, to kind of uh, route new ideas, new concepts in, in, into the regional hubs and then into the markets. But it's, it's typically uncommon for us to put uh, innovations into multi-markets in Asia at the same time. We typically plant single ideas into single markets to solve typically known problems that you have in those markets as opposed to using technology to springboard yourself into a, into a new segment in, in multiple markets at the same time. So, uh, Carl, I think Ergo's business in Singapore is not, it's, it's smaller compared to some of the operations in Europe and so on. So, the question that comes from me, like, to me, like based on some of the conversations we've had with other partners, is that who pays for innovation? Is it is it the, the the big big brother out in Europe or is it more on the country level? Like because I think that's probably the million dollar question a lot of people are asking is this. No, in the end you have to pay it from your own balance sheet and your own results. So that's why it's always a little bit of a problem because we are a very small entity. We have good ideas in Europe, but sometimes I only want a very specific solution for one for one problem, and I would like to have only this one. I don't want to buy the whole car, I just want the front wheel. So that's a little bit always the difficulty getting it here. We are a small market, very competitive, so I can't afford really to have the luxury version. And, and, so, and, and that's also, you know, the, 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 the challenge I, I, I live every day, and the same with Carl, is that you have these great <clears throat> concepts coming out of Europe, but they also typically come with a European price tag, which when you, you have a local business that, com that competes on, on local cost base, you know, and, and you want a small part of that solution, and, and it can't be divested, um, 
you end up then bringing the idea into the marketplace and then go looking maybe at events like this for a local concept which maybe gets you 70-80% of the way but it comes with a local price tag so you can take it on board. Um, the trade-off is sometimes as the regional or the global hub will try and will try and help with the cost of a, of, of a European solution then you get into the running the risk of the local market not having skin in the game and just taking the concept because it's free you know then they get the trade-off of you know European support versus the language support you need in local market here it's it's it, it's a minefield and I think that ultimately it's about the idea and the concept not about the solution that you try and bring into the market because trying to bring a, a European package into South Asia it's it's very difficult to get the the, uh, the local CEOs buy in when they're they're operating on a very local cost base. I think uh, one of the things that is a constant factor in every every answer that we've had here is that what I'm hearing is that you kind of need to have localized kind of innovation because there's, those are the buyers, right? Those are the people that have to do this stuff. And at the end of it, it has to be like other money made or money saved. Like anything else is just uh, is noise, right? Like a lot of partners that we talk to, their KPIs is how many pilots and POCs they do, which is ridiculous. It's, it's good if experimentation is your goal, but if you want to create value, value is very simplified, measured by money made, money saved. Uh, but the common factor is, is the business unit, is that they are the ones that have to do stuff, right? Like the, the opening entities. But a very common problem is that they, they, we are at a stage that a lot of people are still not sold on, on innovation as a thing, or that how they should do this stuff, internal innovation versus open innovation and so on. So how do you go about uh, getting excitement or education or culture change in terms of people buying into this? Uh, let me start with you, Arvin. What do you think about the whole culture question? Uh, it kind of links to what I said earlier as well. That uh, we, it's it starts with clarity of purpose and vision that needs to happen at almost like the board level, right? With that clarity, you need to have the right kind of leadership in place uh, that is not just paying lip service to innovation, but is connecting that into the like you said the KPIs and deliverables of people on the ground. And then this, to then have the supporting capability to also let the innovation happen bottom down, you have to work on the culture, behavior, uh, mindsets piece of that. So we invested in that significantly for the first almost a year of the three year journey that we've been on so far. It was almost entirely focused on what kind of business, what mission do we want to have as an organization in the future? What will it take to get there? What Therefore, mindsets and culture and values are important. And that's where they, it, it, it kind of became clear that innovation is the hero value. Because I mean, this is an industry which has been successful for so long, but given what's happening, there will be such dramatic changes that if we don't have a culture of innovating, of questioning how things are done in the past, of imagining how they will be in the future and reimagining our own business, then there's just no way we can we can we can achieve that uh, future state. Therefore, innovation as a hero value was built and imbued in the organization at every level, um, and that's now paying uh, benefits to us. That it's no longer that the, the comment like this is how things are done you will not hear anymore. It's about. But it's also very business focused. So at the end of the day, it's not about, the KPI is not try five things out. The KPI is take STP levels to a certain stage. Now, how do you take straight through processing up to a dramatically higher number is through innovation. It's through questioning how things are done in the past and how can it be done better in the future. Um, so that's, so, so you're absolutely right. It, there is intent which is top down and there is culture and behaviors which are bottom up and connecting these two things is the only way to, to make it work. So I'm actually curious to hear more as, as you guys are jumping into it. Where do you start if that's the case? Like what's the, what's the actual next step that you feel like you have to take in terms of the, like doing this, like changing culture, getting people to... Yeah, I think we are moving more and more towards uh, service orientation. I think uh, insurance has been historically and still is perceived and it is a financial industry and we have to I think move away from this idea that insurance is about finance 
protection of, of some sort. It, it is about providing services to people in the end uh, and services that does correspond to a, a need that people have at one point in time, whether it is health, whether it is, it is uh, wealth, where it is a, a PNC type of, uh, of interest. In the end, the need is for service. What we are providing today is just a financial compensation for a service. I think our model needs to evolve towards providing a real-time service. Easier said than done, obviously, and to, uh, to link that up to your question on, uh, on, on KPIs, it used to be very easy to have uh, financial KPIs, right? Um, but what does it look like when it comes to introducing a social component in there? What is, what is the social value of what we bring? What is the social value of the services that we bring to people? And how do we embed that? Uh, into the business that we deliver and the services that, that we create. I think that this is the major question that as an industry we have ahead of us. And if we, if we somehow solve that problem, if we have a, a good view on this and deliver a good value proposition in the end, then the rest will feel, flow and our business will, will remain sustainable. There is a big question about sustainability of the insurance model. Um, I think thinking about the real perceived value of the service we bring is, is the answer from a customer standpoint. Yeah, I think for me there's two aspects. One is the, the organization and how brave they are from a cultural point of view on taking on board risk and taking, you know, we talk about how quickly we need to, to learn and to fail and to move on and, and, and grow. Um, but it also, I think it comes down to the, the diversity of your workforce. And, you know, one thing I think in insurance it's still, um, you know, it's still based on your time served. You look across the CEOs in local markets, with all due respect to who's on the panel. Um, you know, it, it's typically people who've been in 20, 25 years of the industry. Um, you know, we've made a commitment to have something like 25% of our senior leaders around the world in the age group of 35 to 44. Now, that might seem quite old to people in the audience, but in the insurance industry, that's seen as quite young. And th th there's a certain amount of risk perceived associated with bringing in you know, young people who don't have the year's service in the industry, you have to be in the insurance industry for 20 years. Well, customers are changing, the model is changing, um, and I think, you know, the organization needs to move and be aggressive with changing the people in the organization to be able to deliver on the strategy, because ultimately, it's the people who are going to execute, and if you don't have the right culture and the people to deliver the culture, then innovation, is, to me, is still going to be seen as a technology play as opposed to an organizational play. So what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's one side is mission-driven approach. It's this is what the business is. Uh, the other side of it are here recruiting, which is recruit a diverse workforce with the right mindset, and that would be a large part. Anything else to add in terms of what do you think? Well, people fear the unknown, and uh, they see something is coming, so you have to explain what is the problem, how can we solve it, and to repeat that story over and over again to to create trust, and then you will have to follow us as well. One of the common problems that I've seen in the space is that this is, this is a normal workflow. An innovation champion, innovation unit inside of a company sends an RFP out to business units and says, what problems do you have? They come back, or don't, or just ignore it, maybe come out with one or two things, and then they're like, these are the problems we're solving. When I've looked into the problem, in a lot of cases, I'm not saying all of it, because people have been doing something for 20 years, that's all they see. They don't think outside of the box. So the problems they typically get is either they don't care because they have very short-term goals. I mean, a lot of companies are quarter to quarter performance, right? Or they just haven't been exposed to more. Do you guys feel like there's a better way, or even if it's the right way, or is a better way of doing this to create that kind of thinking outside of the box mindset that you've seen it works, or any lessons learned there? So, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, fundamentally, that's the approach we're using, but there's a very important step that we do before we ask those questions, which is a reimagine exercise. So, so we did some interesting things on that uh, uh, when we started the whole journey. We put a cross section of our organization through an otherwise very uncomfortable exercise where they were put into situations where 
sometime in the future some very disruptive things will happen. And the question was, how would you prepare between now and then happening for you to succeed in that environment? And that created the seeds of our reimagine uh, path and journey. And that created what capabilities uh, we need, what that we don't have today. How should we reimagine the journey of the customer, the experiences? It became very clear to us that, that we need to have a more seamless, more frictionless, more um, sort of customer-oriented approach than we have right now. And that exposed a lot of the problems that needed to be solved, a lot of the business capabilities that needed to be built. And we have got a whole roadmap of those. And we then pick from those when we do exercises like this, and then we find the right ideas to solve those problems, they, we know exactly where they're going to plug and how. Now, of course, as we do innovation, a large proportion of the innovation is what we call reinforced innovation, which are just make things better. But there are those which are more reimagined, where which takes us, which changes the orbit. And it's a healthy mix of those two. Yeah, I would tend to think that uh, what is really uh, paramount here is exposure, exposure to whatever. So um, one of the difficulties that uh, as anybody else faces is that uh, Asia is, uh, is, is clustered uh, with various countries having very different problems, diff very different issues, very different market penetrations. Um, and however, uh, you want everybody to grow and to grow sustainably and deliver, deliver uh, better business solutions. And, and sometimes you don't even understand the problems that, uh, that you have and you don't even understand that someone elsewhere could have an answer to a problem you even didn't realize you, you had. So there are, I, I don't think that there are many solutions to that. People need to be exposed, they need to travel, they need to understand different contexts, uh, they, they need to see what happens elsewhere. So uh, just having the right tools uh, in order to expose people, let people um, uh, understand that they need time uh, just to, to see what's, what's going on elsewhere is, is just crucial and, and then the solutions will, uh, will come. It is very difficult for people, uh, for managers actually, somehow force people to take that time uh, and invest also in, uh, in, in people traveling, but it is really fundamental. And I think one of the things that was brought up, and we've talked about it a few times, is that uh, as we were reimagining insurance, uh, I kind of feel like the industry is going through an identity moment, which is, are we a financial services company? Are we a protection company? Are we a service company? Or are we a health company? In a lot of cases, life companies are going to that model. Um, and I think part of it also goes into, when you think about why as a consumer I'm paying for insurance, I'm paying for claims. But then it's a matter of how you price the claims, and then it's a matter of distribution. But sometimes I feel like there's more emphasis on distribution. So as we have these discussions going on, as it's the moment that we're reimagining insurance, where do you feel uh, a large part of the focus should be? And this is not an innovation question per se, but I feel like we first need to answer this question before answering what are the innovation priorities, if that makes any sense. The, um, I think it depends on the, the type of insurance, the category, whether you're in general, whether you're in life. And I think in Asia, life insurance has very much more of an investment feel to it than maybe in Europe where there's a lot more protection concept. But for me, if I look at the industry on the whole, you know, we've come out of a business model which is about pooled insurance, which is I don't understand my risk individually, the actuary understands my risk and prices appropriately. I think in five to ten years, the value of my personal data will give me me individually a much better sense of my own risks uh, and that will undermine the value of the pooled insurance concept and you already look in the US how people are moving towards the ability to have you know switch on switch off insurance as and when they have a need which truly changes the, the dimensions of, of our insurance category so absolutely we have to get out of that concept of being all about pooled risk uh, and to have it and to have it not, which is how we've sold it previously. We have to get to a place where we're seen as a service provider because then you get out of the mindset of I have to get a return for the cost that I'm paying for my insurance because that drives poor behavior on the consumer's side of I have to make a claim because I paid $500 this month and therefore I have to get my return back. You position yourself as a service provider either in the health space or the investment space and then the trade-off between what I'm paying and what I'm receiving 
becomes very much more a value equation and not a cost equation. I think that's the model that most insurance companies are trying to move towards because if you rely on the old pool model at some point in time, the availability of data that is held with such you know, esteemed companies like SCORE uh, is going to be transferred from the organization to the individual and then the power switches and then the, the insurance model evaporates. Just uh, jump in there. So you're right. I think there are all of those areas where innovation needs to happen: distribution, pricing of product, and uh, and and then servicing, including claims. But end of the day, the promise of the business is is the claim and the service, right? And often, in, especially in life insurance, that moment of truth happens years after you make the promise. So it's really important that that area is strong. And I'll just share a couple of things that, that came out of some of the work we did. The, the one that we're most uh, excited about was something we launched earlier this year, uh, uh, which is uh, AI-based health claims assessment. Uh, this has been done in other, other industries, but in health it's, it's a lot more complicated. And we've now put in place a capability where uh, you know, hospital bills are ingested, analyzed, all medical classification done, match with what kind of policy the customer has, and whether this is payable or not, partially, fully, and all of those decisions happen, uh, leveraging AI and data models and so on, and the customer on, on the spot within minutes can know whether the claim was approved or not, and as we complete this whole cycle, they would, they would get payment for it as well, right? Uh, that's one area where the promise is, has to be strengthened significantly. Now, there are a lot of other servicing aspects as well, in addition to just the claim. For example, I, I need to change my, my payment processes or what's my policy value right now. And uh, last year we launched a capability, and today, traditionally, the way this happens is customers call their agents, the agents call the call center to get all of this uh, servicing request done. And we put a chatbot in place, and we've given this to our 5,000 agents uh, that they have all of this information on their fingertips now for all of their customers, not just generic questions that a chatbot can serve, but actual policy information for their customers is available on their fingertips, which, which used to take questions that used to take hours or even days can be resolved on the spot. So you're absolutely right. It's across the whole spectrum that we have to, we have to innovate and reimagine. I think we're out of time, so I just want to thank you guys again for participating in the panel. And after the panel, I'd love to continue this conversation actually because I'm interested. So thank you so much, guys, and thank you so much for listening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.